you know, looky loo aspect of certain people who were abused by it. It's it's a totalist control system. And mm. that sounds kind of nefarious. I put that, you know, this nefarious term. Oh, that sounds so, you know, James Bond villain, right? But it's like, that's kind of actually, no, that's that really is what it is. It's, I, I'm not joking. The goal is to give you an awe experience and thereby convince you that L. Ron Hubbard knows what he's talking about. Got it. That's, that's the goal, right? At least initially with auditing, right? Is they is Hubbard Hubbard found great utility in convincing people that they had popped out of their heads back in the 1950s, that they had had ex, an, an out of body experience, that they had gone in Scientology terminology, this is going exterior. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. We're going to talk about the cult. Yes, I said it. Cult of Scientology. Today, I have a special guest. You've never met him here on the channel, and that is Chris Shelton. Welcome to Myth Vision. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. I appreciate you joining me. I know that you know a thing or two. How do I know? Well, if you just journey over to his YouTube channel, he has a ton of videos. Click this video button and you will get lost into the rabbit hole of ex-Scientologist uh, information. And more than that, he ventures even beyond that. But I want to point out, he has some experience. So if you don't mind while I share this, can you tell us what your background is in Scientology? Absolutely. I was uh, raised a Scientologist. Uh, my parents got involved when I was very young. And so pretty much my entire living memory is, is growing up with and around Scientology and Scientologists and playing with other Scientology kids. I did go to public school and I did have that experience and I did live out in the real world for a little while afterwards. But I became immersed in Scientology in a very significant way right out of high school. I was recruited to join staff in Santa Barbara, California. Mm. And I worked there for eight years at the Church of Scientology there. And that was my primary job and, and, and mission in life. And so um, then at 25 years old, I decided, well, I'm not getting enough done and we're not expanding fast enough. And so, you know what? I think it's time for that billion year contract. And I actually went all in. I doubled down rather than, you know, maybe evaluating my life in a different way. And I joined the C organization and I and I did sign one of those billion year contracts. And that was a full time, 24 seven operation. The C organization is the core group of Scientology. I, I, I believe I'm correct in labeling it the fanatical end of Scientology, because these are people who are dedicating their next billion years, you know, your entire life to this. That's not a. They, they say it's symbolic, but, you know, we we in the know knew it was not. We were really dedicating ourselves. And um, I ended up not doing a billion years. I ended up only doing 17 <laughs> before I had my fill of that. And I left. So that gave me 25 years of, of dedicated work full time for the Church of Scientology. And... Uh, I learned a thing or two about the operation at the city level as a as a as a public Scientologist and then as a staff member and then at the highest levels as a Sea Org member. Wow, I really do want to do a follow up at some point <clears throat> to get that story from you, because every one of you have a story. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to know the changing if you're thinking what happened, what did it for you? Um, in today's episode, though, which usually I get people's stories before we deal with the destructive nature of cults that we have mm -hmm. today, it is specifically zeroing on the destructive nature of Scientology. I interview ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, ex-Mormons, ex-Scientologists, ex-Christians, ex-Muslims, you name it, because I find a destructive nature kind of thread through all ideologies in some way, shape or form. And there are various groups that have a higher control whether it's ideological and the control is more in the mind or physical. And so um, I'm curious to know what you've brought for us today. And I liked how you said right before I hit record for everybody to get us eavesdrop into our conversation is that there are Scientologists 
who never experienced the thing, you, Karen Della Carriere, Mike Render, Aaron, Smith Levin. I mean, like the list goes on of anyone outspoken, right? Marty Rathburn, you name it. Like everybody's speaking out. They're like, it's so bad. I got beat up. I got punched by David Miscavige. Um, there was sexual issues going on or this or that. And like, there's so many people who are going, that's not my experience in Scientology. I didn't have that. So they must be lying. Right. Right. And yeah, and that's the problem is that uh, we're not lying. Uh, it is that extreme and it does become that fanatical at the at, at certain levels of it. And yet my take on this, and I think an important one, is that it's not just physical abuse or sexual liberties or abuses that make Scientology bad or wrong. Um, there are are things that are happening uh, of a psychological nature, of a spiritual nature, if you will, at even the lowest levels of Scientology that require, you know, that that, that really need attention, that, that, that are destructive, that are harmful to people. And so it's not just that you need to know about Scientology or learn about Scientology because of the sort of, it's that bad. And it's it's an effort to as a totalist system, it's an effort to take control of and manage every aspect of your life. Hmm. And that's not something that is noticed right away. You know, you get involved and, and the way people generally tend to get involved is through some sort of self-help mechanism, some sort of, you know, we have this class that you can take in communication or in marriage or raising your kids or dealing with your boss. And we have these tools you can use. This is what they say. We have this toolkit for you. And, and if you apply these tools, they work. And if, uh, if you use them, you'll have a better life. And Scientology is all about improving conditions in life. This was a, this was a marketing ploy for quite a while with them. And, um, and it's not hard to see that when you only understand part of the picture. You only see some of those tools at the lower levels and you go, well, this makes sense. This sounds right. Well, of course it does. They would never get any new members if it was Xenu on day one. You know? <laughs> <laughs> would sign up for that, right? So right. it's, you know, it's the same thing as, well, same. it's not same thing, but it's similar to you know, you hear in the Mormon church, you have these magic underwear and, and collab and, you know, the Garden of Eden was in Missouri or something. You hear all these confidential teachings and you go, well, that doesn't sound that that sounds crazy. Scientology has its crazy levels, but but what where it differs from what other groups are doing in some ways is the control starts establishing itself right away. And uh, the technique of their counseling process, which is called auditing, it's, it's really, we only use the word counseling to sort of give people an idea of, of what it kind of compares to, but it's, it's so different from what you would experience in a, in a psychology office or a licensed therapist office that it, it really strains our vocabulary to call it counseling. It's, it's really right. not that, right? It's auditing. And the auditing process of Scientology is really where the, the magic happens. It's where people experience things that, that significantly change their worldview. And the interpretation of those events is what allows them to, or, or, or gooses them, you could say, into, uh, oh, this is it, and, and pay the money and, and, and stay on board. It, it, it even becomes a bit of an addictive process for people. This is a perfect, <clears throat> I'm, I'm even thinking about my experience as a Christian. And I don't want to get caught up in that because we're dealing with the harms of Scientology here. But mm -hmm. I have had experiences with the right circumstances, the music, the altar call, the whole nine. Yep. And you go down and you get this satisfying euphoria, so to speak. And the people around, there's a comforting bubble in which you feel like you're part of the family now. There's something there. Yes. And you attribute that experience to the cognitive, what you think is this God, this Jesus, this yep. belief. Yep. And, and I'm curious to get into the experience of the Scientologist because you're not at an altar. You're not, there's no music playing in the background. Nobody's saying, if you've told a lie, then you told a lie about that lie, but don't worry. God has sent his son to forget, you know, what is the message? What is the, 
What is it that grabs psychologically and gives the experience for the Scientologist that hooks them? And from that day forward, cognitive dissonance and, and just they can't explain away that experience they had when they were auditing or something. What do you think it is? And let's get into the detail here. Absolutely. This is a great question and it, and it, and, and a great example of, of, a, of, of a comparable experience in another group because it is the same brain chemistry, you could say, or the same set of things happening that induce that, oh my God, something incredible just happened to me. There must be something to this. And that's, the, that's what the auditing produces in a very similar way to a religious awe or euphoria experience wow it's it's very similar um and this is not really so different chemically from a drug experience nor is it really so different it, you know we can say all these negative things but we can also go it's also not so different from falling in love the, the, the feelings and the awe and the experience of this these are all shades or spectrum of of love and awe and euphoria and good feelings. And this is something we all crave. It, we want it and there's nothing wrong with wanting that. It feels amazing. You know, this is why we go to concerts. This is why people go to movies. This is why people read poetry. This is, it's all about the feels. And, and again, totally organic, completely natural. It, yes, let's do it, right? But where, cults or where con men or where domestic abusers come into the picture here is they sort of taint this picture with lies and deceptions and they tell you well here's this experience you're having now let me give you an interpretation or 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 a translation of why you're having that experience Mm. And, you know, for you, it was a Jesus moment. You're in this crowd of people. There's there's the group, you know, sort of dynamic of it. There's the, you know, the every there's maybe music and, you know, kind of high level spiritual sort of feelings and emotions. And there's there's trust and there's there's awe and there's, you know, there's a lot of things to this mix. Mm -hmm. And it gives you this spiritual experience, this feeling of of, wow, I'm. I'm experiencing something bigger than me, something larger than life, something I have not felt in a long time. I only, you know, I've got a handful of these kind of incidents in my life. This must mean something. Well, with Scientology, you're primed, you're told and, you know, and set up to believe that when you go into these auditing sessions and you are made to remember or recall or relive past moments of pain and trauma and um, unconsciousness, in Scientology, they call these moments engrams. This is a Dianetics thing, and this is how it kind of all started. Is you go back through and you and you have and this is known by the way freud lectured about this technique this is not something hubbard had to invent right he, he cribbed it and <laughs> and psychology has long since learned through actual scientific study yeah this kind of stuff doesn't really work so good it doesn't do what you think it's doing and it more often than not actually solidifies the trauma rather than releases it so it, that's kind of what I'm talking about with these curves that can be entered into this is the Dianetics and Scientology auditing procedure has you go through this process of reliving trauma with the idea you're told beforehand you're going to relive it and then you might even need to go to earlier times where you had similar things happen to you until the trauma, the stress, the engram blows, erases, is no more, is gone. And when that happens, you're going to feel amazing and you're going to feel wonderful and all of that. Well, for a percentage of people, not 100% by any stretch, they are able to go back through incidents with this priming and the way they're put back through the incidents, the auditing process, is trance induction. It's hypnotism. They're, they actually induce a trance in you or they get you through rep repetition, rep repetition of uh, thought, of, of words, of, of sayings, things they'll actually say to you. 
um, or have you say back to them <laughs> that will put you into these trance states. And, you know, there's a lot that could be said. And I know hypnotism is controversial in some people's minds and stuff. And I'm not talking about the, you know, you're getting very sleepy kind of thing. It's not that obvious. This is a very different form of trance induction. Um, but trans induction happens all kinds of ways. But the point is that when it does, you become more suggestible. Your critical thinking skills go down. Your awareness of environment goes down. You're kind of in a little bit of a different place. In fact, my friend John Atak has described hypnotism as guided imagination. And that's what an auditing session really turns into, is it's guiding your imagination. You are inventing and imagining things that have happened to you in the past even. And that can end up in false memory syndrome, especially when we're talking about remembering things that happened to you in a past life. And I'm probably jumping through all kinds of- Oh uh, no, this is good. This is good. Cause I interviewed, I'm sure you've heard of the Australian Jesus. Um, the guy who thinks he's Jesus reincarnated in Australia and he has a real compound in Australia right now. I interviewed him. Um, oh, wow. He's going to have to duke it out with that guy in Russia who's that, saying Jesus- I want to interview that guy, but he is yeah. in prison, I think, uh, or at least got arrested for who knows what. I, I don't know. But wow. it's an interesting thing you're describing here, because let's get into this whole state of the um, grabbing the cans, as they call them, to yeah. to go through this process of auditing. Um do they, so there, there's the emotions. We talked about that. They're going through these emotions. Oftentimes there's traumatic ones or bad and good. Do they try to lead you once you're suggestible into a happy place? Is that the goal or is it to a place of like, I've had enough and it's like blank screen kind of in the mind. Like you, you feel like you've emptied out your thinking or something. What are they trying? What is their goal? Do you know? Um. And maybe we should clarify here just to make this a complete thought. Scientology believes or pushes the idea that you are not you, the, the entity who is you, the thoughts in your head, the emotions you experience, the feelings you have. All of that is actually you as a spiritual entity who is kind of buried or or contained inside the body or around the body. And your spirit or you, you, not your spirit, you as a spiritual entity, they call that a thetan in Scientology. They, they use that word for it. So, you know, from Greek theta. Um, Hubbard was big on creating new words and thetan is one of them. And that's rather than call it a soul or a ghost or a spirit, they call it a thetan. But it's the same thing. And that's who you really are in Scientology's faith system. So your body is an accessory. It's a doll. It's a thing you're operating. You've had millions of them. You've been around a long time. You can't die. There's nothing in, the, in this world or in this universe that can kill you or make you cease to exist. However, the quality of your existence is in question because you've been in this physical universe, according to Scientology. And this is after day one. You, you, you know, it takes a little while uh, to learn all this stuff. But the, but the fundamental dogma of Scientology demands that you believe this, that you are a spiritual entity, that you have lived before, that you will live again, and that you cannot die. But because of that, you only can accumulate stress and trauma and death and even birth is traumatic. I mean, you know, I don't think anybody really enjoyed going through birth. That's a traumatic episode, right? right. So, so every single life you've had, even if you live a life of, 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 of flowers and butterflies and rainbows and gumdrops, you still had to be born and you're still going to die. And those two things are going to be traumatic if nothing else in your life ever is. And you're going to have the cycle through millions and even billions and billions of times. You've lived a long time in this universe, according to Hubbard. <laughs> so the accumulation of all of that stress and trauma and everything is what's weighing you down now. This is the, this is the, the, the key principle of Scientology is all of that stuff. It's kind of like, um, since we're on Christmas time, right? Jacob Marley with the chains that, you know, that he has to yeah. carry around with him, right? It's just like that, except your chains go on for miles. 
How wow. You- it's in it, to analogize it to Christianity. It's the burden of sin for things you've done bad in your conscious life. And there's a, it's, it's really the, um, um, I'm going to sell you the disease, but I, but, or I'm going to tell you, I'm going to convince you of the disease so I can sell you the cure. And this is exactly what, you know, you're a fallen creature who deserves to be cooked and burned by, uh, God all forever. But, you, but he loves you so much that, yeah. he's, you know, and it's like, Oh, yeah. okay. It's like these weird double binds that don't make any sense. You know, it's like, they, how is this true when this is true? And it's crazy making. And that's, and Scientology is full of that. Um, so, so yeah, so that's exactly what they're doing is they're telling you, this is the basic problem. Now this is after, again, this is not day one stuff. This is stuff they're going to feed you after they've given you the common sense toolkit and you've had some experience, experience, some, some assistance in your life. You have been helped in some fashion. You've helped yourself in some fashion using this knowledge. And because this, you know, the first and only place apparently you've ever heard of this common sense knowledge was in a Scientology course room. You think L. Ron Hubbard's the guy who came up with it and, and, and he's not, he plagiarized everything, but that's the experience they're trying to get you right away. Wow. And then once they get you hooked, right, once you're like, eh, you're in there, then they start selling you this higher level auditing and, and you progress up what's called the bridge. You, you, you cross what's called the bridge to total freedom where the idea, the promise here is, and this is a really big carrot for people to, to chase after <laughs> is they promise you that ultimately you are going to rid yourself of all these shackles, all this guilt, all this trauma, all this pain that you've been carrying around with you. In this and all of your previous lives, I really got to stress that you got to buy into that in order to really make it in Scientology. Excuse me. So you're going to unburden all that. You're going to get rid of all of it. And we're going to return you to your native state. You're going to become not just you're not going to just become or re- return back to being a Thetan. You're going to be an operating Thetan. OT. And that's, ah. that's the key thing in Scientology is being OT. And the, the, the whole point of being OT and the reason why people strive for it, pay for it, jump through, you know, all these crazy loyalty hoops to get there, pay all this money to do it, is it's a godhood. It's a state where nothing can stop you where you are returned back to your spiritual power of even being able to create and modify and change matter, energy, space, and time. You are, you are in a position now, which is called cause over life. Your cause, you're in the driver's seat. Hmm. And cause is a big word in Hubbard's lexicon. Hub, or cause is, Hubbard was all about being cause not being the opposite, he termed it, effect. You don't want to be effect. You want to be cause. You want to be the guy making things happen, not the person who's having things done to them. This reminds me of the nutty interview I saw with Tom Cruise laughing with the Mission Impossible tune. And he is really, I bet you and others who were Scientologists, who know what you're describing here in depth, are watching him what what I would describe as an egotistical meltdown of like, he is chuckling and he goes, and, and I know that I'm the only person who can change anything. And it's like, cause he's the cause. And it's like, right. he, now this makes sense. I was wondering what is, you know, I bumped into him in Florida once uh, at Disney world. Anyway, just went right past him. Then I saw 20 bodyguards. I was like, Oh snap. That's uh, Tom Cruise. But he has this ego about like, you can see what you're saying and he believes it. he's practicing that godhood of uh, there's a car accident. And, and, and this is what really didn't make sense to me as a non-Scientologist. Nobody can help that person, but you know that you can. And I'm like, my dad's a medic in the special forces who like retired Green Beret. My dad knows how to physically help if an arm or a limb goes missing and chopped off or something traumatic he knows what he's talking about but the fact that he had this belief that he's the only one who could do something it's really delusional 
to assume that. Like, are you a medic, Tom? Do you know what you're doing? Do you understand like the anatomy? And be- that's not the point. I don't know. I don't know how he would answer these criticisms. I know he wouldn't because he would just over talk you and then be aggressive. But anyway, no, he wouldn't. And 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 he's actually even. Uh, and, and this is this is no. Um, you know, let's let's let's. Uh, this is no apologetics for Tom. Right. It's he's actually talking more in the spiritual realm than he is maybe about you know direct first aid. Hubbard does see it over that. Yeah, you need to give first aid to people when they're bleeding out in front of you. But otherwise, he says, doctors aren't a whole lot of good. You know, they're good for patching up broken bones and bleeding arteries and things like that. But otherwise, they don't really know what they're talking about. And the reason for it, and this is where Hubbard's, where Tom Cruise's narcissism and egotism come from, is Scientology inflates it because it makes you believe that you are becoming more and more cause. You are the one who's, you know, uh, able to make anything happen. And Scientologists tend to focus on the spiritual side of, of our existence rather than the physical side as much. They, they, they do care about our immediate, you know, your immediate life because you got to pay for your bridge. You got to get up the bridge. You got to get to OT. And it's a long series of steps. It's not a hop, skip and jump. It's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. It's years of time. There is nobody who skips to the front of the line because they pay a lot of money and they get up to OT8 in six months. It doesn't work that way for anybody. It is a long series of indoctrination steps. And this is uh, based on, we won't get into this too much right now, but it's based on an old Freemason you know, a cult model makes uh, sense to me. Yep. Yeah. Levels and confidential rituals and rites and confidential scriptures, you know, and all of that. That's all part of the Scientology framework. So so there's a lot in the mix, which is why it's always so fun to talk about it, because you could talk about it forever because there's so much to it. Mm. So so trying to keep it on this auditing line, um, you're trying to get to OT. And that's eventually the dream that is actually being sold to you. And when you believe that these awe experiences, these euphoric experiences that are happening in the auditing sessions, when you believe that that is a feeling that is reflective of a spiritual gain and that there are many, many more such gains to be had. And in fact, you've only touched, you've only peered behind the curtain of greatness that is who you really are and what you can become. You know, you really get on that ride. I mean, that's a ride you want to be taking. You want to get up to the place where you are a god. And they don't talk about it that way. Right. We're using that language. Yeah, I'm using that language specifically because the only thing that compares in the big wide world to people's concept of what an OT would be is God. I mean, it's a person who has attained a state of cause over life matter, energy, space, time, and form. There's, there's nothing that an OT theoretically can't do. So, including creating his own universe. I mean, Hubbard talks about it in those terms. He says, you can create a universe, you can modify, you can destroy a universe, and not just in your head, like for real. I, this makes me want to ask, and I don't, maybe we shouldn't go down this rabbit trail, but I just figure I'd ask you because yeah. I know that there are other cult members, cult leaders, Joseph Smith, for example, right? People ask me this question all the time. Did he believe his own nonsense? And the answer is yes and no, probably. And, right. and like, the, this is, the, it's like, but he's a con man. So you think he believed his stuff if he's a con man, which many people would point out, you know, he's a con man. Like we have legal reasons that this guy was doing illegal things in, in, in Joseph Smith's case. And uh, that's still experts say, no, like, like the guy really believed his own stuff. And the question is, do you think L. Ron Hubbard actually believed these things or, or what do you think? I mean, you can't read the guy's mind, but. Yeah. And it's a, and it's a deep well um, to go down. But what I'll say, I I have a couple answers to this. First off, I'll say that in terms of the experience of Scientology for you and me and thee, it doesn't matter Mm -hmm. what Hubbard's mindset was. He's been dead since 1986. It It does not reflect at all in the experience of Scientology 
what Hubbard was thinking. Right. This uh, is more an intellectual question. Exactly. Um, yeah. But we can answer it. We actually do have data that, that tells us, um, at least to one degree or another. One, he was a con man and he knew it. He was a pathological liar. There's absolutely positively no way he was not aware of that. He was one of those larger than life storytellers, always the center of attention, always the biggest guy in the room. He was never the dude in the corner. When he was in a room, you knew it. You know, he was that guy mm -hmm. and he could spin stories all night long. And he was kind of a practice professional at it because he'd been doing it since he was a kid. Um, just his way of getting along in the world. And uh, and he was and he was good at it sometimes, not good. Other times people would often, you know, be taken in by him and then learn the, the truth of the matter is that he was not telling the truth after they got scammed by him or after they got burned by him in some way or another. So he left an awful lot of a trail of an awful lot of upset people behind him way before Dianetics and Scientology even came around. Uh, he was also a um, Pulp Fiction writer. It helped him with that. But he had uh, this underlying fundamental belief in himself and his ability to overcome his circumstances. And, and he wanted power over other people. His private writings, uh, his journals and, his, and something called the Affirmations, uh, which are published. You can even find them on the Wikipedia these are private writings of his own. He never expected them to get out anywhere. And the church has validated indirectly through court that these are valid documents. This is not, uh, we don't have a whole lot of question about the accuracy or validity of this. And Hubbard wrote in his own handwriting, you know, I want to make men my slaves. Women cannot, you know, uh, resist me. I am, I am a Superman kind of thing. This goes on for pages. There's just pages and pages. Holy crap. Oh yeah. Oh. So, wow. and, and the whole slave thing is a little disturbing, you know, because Hubbard uh, bragged when in a, in a letter to uh, uh, another author friend of his back in the day that uh, a, an early work he had written pre Dianetics uh, along the same line of how people think and act and, and how we can deal with them. He said, he's got a manual here of how you could actually rape somebody and get away with it. Pretty harsh language, I know, uh, but that's what he's, you know, he put it out there. Uh, this was a guy who liked to get one over on people. That was part of his character right away. And, and his lying sort of thing would get him in trouble in the military, got him in trouble with his marriages, all kinds of problems. So, so he's not a person that you would say has, you know, of high moral repute. Then he then he hits on, you know, this thing with Dianetics, which is hypnotism repackaged. And initially, when he was working it with some friends of his and stuff uh, who were more honest people, it appeared that there was something legitimate here. They were having legitimate. Wow, something's different kind of experiences. But it was just straight hypnotism. And the process of the hypnotism was transinduction. Let's go back and recall these incidents. Let's go through them until they release, until they erase, until they're no longer in your memory. Uh, part of, you know, of your trauma. Well, we now know trauma doesn't work that way at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but back in 1950, he could sell this. And he did. And people bought it. Uh, the fact of the matter is there is no release of trauma happening. Trauma doesn't release that way. Um, but you can have very interesting experiences going down memory lane. And for example, one clinical psychologist has explained uh, that going back and sorting out levels of responsibility in your past could be useful, mm -hmm. could be helpful, could trigger something, you know, oh, hey, wow. I, th I thought all this time it was my fault, but actually it was my mom's. Hey, look at that. And you have this boink. Oh, wow. I actually feel better about that now. There's your ah, you know, ah, wow. I really feel better about that now, right? So you can have something happen, but that doesn't mean it's your spirit <laughs> or your reactive mind or these other nonsense explanations Hubbard gives. So he comes up with this technology and it takes off. It's a valid runaway bestseller in May of 1950. Dynetics is published and, and America loves it. 
until they try it and then learn it doesn't do what it says it'll do. <laughs> Philip Hubbard kept it going because people were asking him questions and he realized, oh, I've got something on my hands here. People are really interested in this. So he starts lecturing in public forums and he starts talking about how there's new, better techniques that he's developing. And he spends the next, you know, 30 years convincing people that his new, better techniques will get them to the place Dianetics promised, but it'll get them there faster, easier, differently. I mean, he worked <laughs> it 20 or 30 times. This is good. This is good. I just want to make mention here. That I, and there's so many things you said that I we could uh, get lost in. And w one of the things I, I would be curious about is I'm wondering if there's like a night or a day where he's hanging out with his buddies and they're kind of experimenting this on themselves because they're influenced by you know, well-known thinkers of the time who are dabbling in this. Another thing that comes to mind as a recovering addict and alcoholic, I've been in 12-step programs many, many times, and there's a therapeutic aspect to the steps that we find in step five, going and telling another alcoholic, mm -hmm. you know, things that you aren't supposed to tell anybody or that you can confide in communicating with and then making amends whenever possible, except yeah. for when to do so would harm uh, others. Right. So um, so like there is this this release you get from going down memory lane, making a list of things, putting it on paper, examining where I was at fault, where I may not have been at fault, things like that, but trying to own responsibility along the path of cleaning up your side of the street. And there is this, there is something there. And I know that from doing the 12 steps multiple times in my life as a person trying to just survive. I mean, literally right. just trying to survive addiction. Um, but I imagine like, did the guy actually experience this himself and said, Ooh, this would be perfect. And, and then somehow he had an aha moment himself and is so narcissistic Combine that kind of like with the Joseph Smith thing, right? Uh, well, yes, it's, it does go in that direction in that Hubbard was trying to fix himself. He had a lot of problems. He had physical problems. He had spiritual problems, you could say, or psychological issues. He was, um, I, I think, in hindsight, and I am not a clinical psychologist. I've, right. you know, my master's is in coercive control, not therapy. So I, it, so I only speak on this stuff sort of tenderly, but yeah. Um, but there are certainly indications in Hubbard's behavior and reputed behavior of bipolar disorder, of, you know, manic uh, issues. He would be up and down and, and he had drinking issues. Uh, he would he would, you know, just go on bend, benders, binges. Um, and he did drugs. Right. He, he, and he talked about that in, in various places, uh, more so in the early days of Dianetics than in the later days. But there is a later reference to pinks and grays. So, you know, so Hubbard and, and he died even on psychotropic medication. So so the man had influences of, from lots of different places, but he um, was trying to, again, according to his writings, fix himself. And he did not have a high regard for other people. He pretended to when he needed to, but he didn't really. He was a serial philanderer. He cheated on every one of his wives. He treated his kids like crap. He was just not this really good guy, but he always took such great pains to try to present himself as this good guy. Mm -hmm. So, again, that's where the kind of con aspect of this comes in. And yet, at the same time, we have the other side of the coin that... He's desperately trying to fix himself. It's just that the thing with, yeah, it's just the thing is that um, he never could. <laughs> yeah. He never could. He never did. And the more years went by that he wasn't fixing himself and coming up with different and new ideas and techniques to fix himself, the worse he got. And near the end, the last, I'll say, 10, 15 years of his life, he became reclusive. He became extremely paranoid uh, to the point where they were witch hunting Scientologists internally. I mean, it was really bad. And um, and more and more megalomaniac, you know, more and more must have all the power, must have all the power and actually taking steps in the end 
that would have destroyed his entire Scientology network and project if other people hadn't been there as true believers to uh, dedicate the hundreds and thousands of hours it took to pick up the pieces and keep it going. Wow, there's so much here. There's yeah. you are a minefield, and and I I know I could spend days recording with you, and I know I'm going to have to. So, <laughs> and I know the audience watching is going to have to go subscribe to this channel if you really want to get lost. Yeah. I I want to learn these things. Um, there's so much. So you know the behavior that you described at the end of his life, the last 10, 15 years. And this witch hunt among themselves, this is behavior we see and have seen repeat itself. Um, I even heard once, just giving an analogy of Romulus and Remus as the founders of Rome, uh, some Romans believed there was a prophecy that Rome would be destroyed from its own because of the from what happened to Romulus and Remus, which, by the way, is a legendary story to begin with. But it's like they saw this and sure enough, from the inside out, Rome itself uh, eventually collapses with the help of outsiders that are poking at the walls. But um, I use that analogy to say, like, look at the behavior of the onset here and what's going on. No wonder we see, you know, uh, Miscavige the way he is at the top. I don't want to get off track because we're talking about the harmful things, but it's important to know its founder and how its founder approaches these dated concepts, dated practices, um, and literally creates a mythology, a science fiction mythology going back to the, these are actually psychologist aliens that are like, you know, like it's, you know what I mean? Like, oh, dude, there's so many layers to it. We, oh, oh, I love it, though. It's funny. I've done whole podcasts on the space mythology of Scientology. And then I've done whole podcasts on the you know the the actual problem with Scientology auditing it took me like two and a half hours to like break it all down like what's really wrong going on there with all that transinduction and other stuff and then I've done other podcasts about the shunning and the religious abuse that goes on in Scientology I mean there's layer upon layer of stuff here and we've only hinted at you know the occult foundation of Scientology which is a whole nother episode I mean there's just Jeez. lots to break down with this thing. Uh, okay, okay. So maybe we're doing a flyby, right? Because we're just we're just doing a flyby. Yeah. And, and with this flyby, Chris, can you tell us other than the 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 as Karen mentioned in an interview I've done with her, the bait and switch. Um, boom, we give you this solution to your problem. See, ah, you see, it's true. Then they can switch on you, and now you're hooked. Um, what are some other foundational? You don't have to be, you know, going up closer to David Miscavige's to see the harms. What are some foundational harmful things that they are giving you right out the gate in introducing you to this? Uh, sure. Um, other points tend to be, well, there's there tends to be a lot of love bombing at the beginning, which is a standard recruitment technique for a lot of uh, groups and cults, but love bombing is is where they're you're showering you with adulation, praise, ego boosting statements, things that'll you know make you feel good and stuff like that. But they're also at the same time introducing to you what are called thought stopping cliches, where there's just trite mantras or words or language or phrasing that shuts down thinking rather than encourages it. Um, if you start asking questions, even on day one about, well, I read on the internet or, well, I saw Leah's show or, well, I heard about this. Oh yeah. No, 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 no. That's, you know, you can't believe what you hear on the internet. End of story. That's it. That's all they're going to say. Like, there's not going to be any, and let me tell you, Leah got this wrong and this wrong. And no, they're not going to take it to that level. They're just going to tell you, no, 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 you can't believe what you hear on the internet and skip it. And you might think, well, that's a little brush off. For them, that's all the thinking required. And that's right. all the thinking they expect you to do about it because they just want you to take them at their word that they know what they're talking about. Well, I'm a Scientologist and I've never experienced any of that. So therefore, it's all a lie. That's not logical. That's not a logical statement at all. Right. It just says you haven't experienced it. But that's the unwarranted you know, kind of thinking that goes on in, in, in groups like this is critical thinking becomes you know, the enemy of the activity, it becomes, you know, no, 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 we don't want any of that. And in fact, they'll kick you out if you keep doing it. 
You know, if you keep asking questions or you start saying, well, wait a minute, I don't quite understand. Well, what about this and this and this? Okay, well, there's the door. Clearly, we're not for you. You know, take a hike. And they'll and they'll they'll kick you out rather than engage seriously with you on these questions. Uh, if you get a go getter staff member, maybe a new guy or somebody who hasn't really caught, gotten the word yet. They might try to engage with you for a little while, but the people who actually have the answers to the questions that you're looking for, yeah, they're not going to come anywhere near you. That's an interesting point, right? They already have the answer. And if they hear something contrary, they're looking at you like, what's wrong with you? That's right. Like Something's wrong with you because you just don't see what I know. Exactly. And I get a lot of comments on YouTube when I do critical response videos uh, pertaining to Christianity from those types you, you get those types who are like you're already you already the, and they'll say stuff like the first three sentences told me enough you don't know what you're talking about you're completely lost and you need to ask god to, you know like yeah this goes on but that's yeah. right and and these thought stopping cliches i mean we see them all over christianity and, yeah. and again not to rag on people's beliefs that's not my point my point is that there is phrasing in any religion, in any activity that doesn't want you thinking too much, mm. there's pat phrasing that you hear over and over and over again, or you've heard of it, even if nobody's told it to you directly, that is intended to shut down conversations and shut down thinking. God has a plan. It's all it's all going according to plan, right? Well, what plan? Where? How do I? Where, where am I, is is this plan right. like out somewhere? What is the, what? What exactly was it in the plan that required my child to die? Because I'm not quite tracking with that. Yeah, part, you know. And then they follow up with God works in mysterious ways. Don't you, you know? know? <laughs> So you aren't supposed to know that. Duh. We know that you're not supposed to know that. The fact that you want to know that tells us how dumb you are. I'm just kidding. Uh, That's how they respond. And, you, right. and, it's, and it's actually quite shocking, you know, the, the level of emotional, you know, reaction or vitriol that can come out if you start asking too many questions. Um, this is, you know, this is kind of uh, a red flag uh, that you can watch for with groups is, you know, what happens when you ask too many questions. Hmm. So we have obviously cliche shutting down of your critical faculties because of both the combination of we already have the answer and you know what you felt when we audited you. Right. So why the hell are you even asking these? You know, you're going against who you really are by questioning that experience that you got from only the one place that has the answer, which we already told you. Why are you going down that path? We've already gave you the experience. So uh, I'm, I'm tracking what you're putting down, Chris. You are completely tracking. And how you just talked is exactly how they talk. Wow. Yeah. Sign me up if you're paying. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so <laughs> so we have those two. And I'm sure there's everything like, like a web that goes together. What yeah. else would you say um, are some of the things that are harmful that they're doing? Well, okay. So then the other thing is the curves that get entered in, right? Um, okay. For example, I talked about, I mentioned earlier, devil binds. Here's one. You're told in Scientology and you read in L. Ron Hubbard's books that communication is the universal solvent, that it will dissolve everything, that if you're having a problem in life or with other people, communication is generally going to be the answer to that problem. If you're if you know, if you're mad at me, well, we can sit and stew or we can sit down and talk and maybe through talking, we'll figure it out. And that's a that's practically a, a law in Scientology, right? Communication is very important. And one of the things that I bonded with Scientology very early on uh, with was their communication emphasis. And yet, if somebody, anybody that you know <laughs> says a bad thing about Scientology, that is somebody that you need to kick out of your life immediately and at once and never look back. Lock the door, shut it, slam it closed, and that person is, is, you know, is never to darken your doorway again. Well, how do these two things go together? They don't, obviously. They're completely polar opposite concepts. But Scientologists hold both of these things to be true at the same time. And it's mind-numbing. It's actually crazy-making because you read in the materials that L. Ron Hubbard wrote and... He wrote both of these things. <laughs> so he writes that communication is the universal solvent. 
you know, this is how we're going to deal with things. He even breaks it down into a formula, like a mathematical formula, like cause, distance, effect, you know, with intention, attention, duplication, and understanding. Like he's got this whole thing to this. Wow. This is how communication works between living or live beings. And he breaks all this down and says, this is super important. Auditing doesn't work if you don't do this. Life doesn't work if you don't do this. And then you go, okay, Ron, well, here's this person who's got some pretty big, you know, disagreements with you and your subject. Maybe we should go talk to him. Oh, no, 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 no. That, that person's declared a suppressive person and he's just a criminal. He's just, an, he's just awful. He's immoral. And we're not going to have any connection with him of any kind, because if you if you were to talk to him, he could poison your mind. It's called N theta in Scientology. He could give you that's just N theta. They just they just dump N theta on you, which means that word means lies, rumors, bad news, vicious propaganda, you know, bad stuff. It's N theta. That's all just N theta. And as soon as that word enters the conversation. Talk about thought stopping cliches. That conversation's over. No Scientologist wants to engage within Theta. Wow. So these two things don't go together. And these are fundamental principles of Scientology. I'm not talking about some back of the closet minutia. This is frontline stuff, both of these. And, and they exist simultaneously in Scientologists' heads as though it makes sense. And it doesn't make any sense. And that's that's the kind of thing that is done to your thinking in groups like this is they mess with you and, and install ideas that are mutually exclusive ideas and then force you to figure it out so that you don't think it's mutually exclusive, even though it clearly is. It's I'm going to analogize and tell me if I'm um, close yeah. to what you're describing. Uh, within Christian circles, their whole mission, and they are on a mission um, to convert the world, to go and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, however you want to pronounce it. And um, they go out and they're supposed to preach the gospel, the right gospel, of course, you know, not that one that, not the one that Paul's literally rebuking in Galatians, but Paul's specific gospel. And there's four different types of gospels. Anyway, that's a whole another question. There's, yeah, yeah, yeah. We got to cross that one out. So they're preaching the gospel and um, they get someone who absolutely refuses and rejects. And let's just say is sophisticated using thinking critical skills. They weren't hooked in by the experience and therefore they weren't sold something that they couldn't go against. Um, eventually what happens when they do that, and this is the cliche, they run around and they say, you know, you're not supposed to cast your pearls before swine. And you go, well, hold on. I'm supposed to convert the world. But at some point when they reject your message, reject your gospel, they're villainized in this kind of thing. And they're going in, they're just sold off to the devil. Like right. they are literally swine at this point. Stop casting your pearls before swine if you can't convince them of these things. I'm not saying all Christians do this, but it's kind of built into the reason why is they're just not going to get it. So you you That's stop. Right. And they use that kind of phraseology like here's our little escape route. Since they won't listen to us about Scientology, we're going to go ahead and uh, say that you need to cut them off. You just can't. You're wasting your time. You risk yourself going away buy their poison than then just you know leaving them all together that's the best thing you could do is just leave them be exactly and and and, and the wording there is really does a lot of the heavy lifting right because what you have there is you have an effort at what we call othering right us versus them those are the bad guys we're the good guys we're the ones who have the truth with a capital t they're the ones who reject the truth who won't accept it and because we can us versus them, those folks, we maintain our saintly self-image and our <laughs> and our pride and, and and you know we don't go into doubt, right? And uncertainty. Right. Right. We avoid that with this, you know, we're gonna bolster ourselves. And they're they're aligned with the devil, they're aligned with the bad things. Well, the, the analogy is perfect in Scientology because it's the exact same thing. They other anybody who isn't on board with Scientology. And you know, and you're like, well, um, 
you know, you, you, you come in, you get all this love bombing. They're like, Oh, one of the points that they'll use with the love bombing is how aware you are, how, how extraordinarily perceptive you are, or how, um, you know, spiritually advanced you are that you could walk by and spot your group, see where you needed to be, right? Understand the importance of this and the magnitude of what you're getting involved in and how, and how it would only be a big being like yourself, uh. <laughs> who would see, right? Who would know, you know, that we're really onto something because, you know, Hubbard says only the upper 10th of the upper 20th of people will even become auditors. They're that special, you know, and mm. this whole special status thing is part and parcel of, of cultic recruitment and, and retention. And you got to be among the special people. And, and, you know, it makes sense. I mean, everybody can kind of go, ah, those stupid people. But I mean, think about it for yeah. a second. Who doesn't want to be special? Be special. Exactly. Who doesn't want to feel that way? We all do. We all do. And, the, the the thing that these groups do is they get away with bolstering your ego way beyond where it should be bolstered. All of us should feel better about ourselves, but we should not have the view that because we hold a certain set of beliefs, because we know things other people don't know or have experienced things other people don't know or haven't experienced, because of those things, none of those make us better people than others. Mm. We don't have more value. We don't have more meaning and we are not more special snowflakes because of those three things. But these groups are all about fostering the idea that we are. And, and that's that inbred narcissism that, that starts coming out with these things. And Scientology really does lay it on quite thick over and over and over again so by the time you're at the level of a tom cruise where you're at these upper ot levels where you've been given all the secret sauce you start thinking of yourself in very you know gratuitously egotistical ways and that's a scary place to be when you're so gone that i don't know i mean these are these are opinions but as far as he, as deep as he has gone, and I suspect he's gone deeper than many ex-Scientologists who are there in terms of the psychological brainwashing that yeah. he has endured because of the status he has within the cult as well. Do you ever see him coming out? I mean, I, I'm not going to say it's, there's no hope for anybody, but like, I don't think they'll ever allow him to get to that point. What do you think? Oh, no, he could leave tomorrow if he wanted to. I mean, they, they couldn't stop him if he wanted to leave. There's no there's nothing there keeping him there against his will. Right. The thing about narcissistic inflation is that you kind of have to have a little bit of that there to start with. Right. You can't. Yeah, I don't know that you can create narcissism from from right. scratch. But if you go back in Tom Cruise's history, for example, you'll find, you know, an, an incredibly inflated ego from very early on. And he was always walking around on sets, you know, even back to the outsiders, you know, all the way Good back. Movie. <laughs> yeah, great movie. Um, big cast of people, lots of talent on that set. But you can bet Tom Cruise, you know, was absolutely sure he was the most talented. And he, and he, and he wasn't, you know, he's not the most talented actor, but he is willing to work hard. I'll give him that. He absolutely works his ass off and he's willing to be even put himself in harm's way. Some might say that's a little extreme and silly. That's why we have stunt men, but you know, Tom's all about self gratuit, you know, gr gratification and, uh, and, uh, self prop, you know, propaganda. He's always about, uh, talking about himself. So that's kind of always who he was. And Scientology got its hooks on him pretty early back in the mid 80s. And so he has been ego bumped, you could say, right, uh, many times. And it and it's like money. It just brings out whatever's there. It, it, it brings it out more. Right. You know, uh, one analogy before we wrap this thing up, I bring it back to my specialty. You know, you have the Scientology know-all when it comes to these things, whereas I have more of the Christianity know-all from my experience. So um, I was part of the Reformed camp towards the latter parts of my Christianity, where I th 
God predestined people. He had elect special people that he predetermined before the foundation of the world whose names would be in the Lamb's Book of Life. He knew who was and who wasn't, right? And depending on... That was your brand. That was where I ended up, yeah. So I, for okay. for a period of time, I thought God predestined everything. Yeah. There are certain groups within the group that think, well, no, like he didn't actively cause, right, everything to be the way it is. He passively causes. So he either actively of like goes and inserts his spirit into people, which is the people who believe, by the way, he chose them. And right. he's, he's also the one who makes them sustain their faith. So when you leave, it's part of their five tulip theology, uh, total depravity, uh, unconditional election. He chose you unconditionally before the foundation of the world. Limited atonement. Jesus' death and blood was only poured out for those he died for which are the ones that are going to be saved. Irresistible grace, where eventually God's grace will overwhelm you and you will come to the gospel and you will come to believe. And perseverance of the saints, those who remain faithful till they die or to the end, until the coming of the Lord, those are the ones. And so in my theology, I actually was never truly a believer because I left. So it's like this trap door. Once you walk in, if you walk out, duh, even the believers who watch me on my channel, I get a lot of these comments. You were never really truly a believer. Right. You were that that little seed that landed in the crack of the, the asphalt and it sprouted up quick, but it died out. You were never really chosen. But there is a psychological thing that goes in it. And there's their answer is within their own circular reasoning. You can't you can't get out of the bubble. How do you get people out of that bubble in Scientology? What is it that you have found that has worked, Chris? If you don't mind me asking. No, it's fine. I mean, it's you know, it's a little bit of a complicated question, but I know, right? <laughs> um, you know, how do you get people out? Well, <laughs> uh, basically, what I've what my take, my my idea of this, and it, and it's it's maybe a little reductionist, and it's not a hundred percent. It doesn't, uh, you know, there are other reasons people get out, but the way I see it, mostly it starts with or is hinged on a moral, a, an undeniable moral transgression of some kind is witnessed or experienced by the individual in the in the group, and. And they react negatively to that because it's undeniable. I mean, there's a lot of moral transgressions or immoral acts or crimes, you could say, that people witness in groups uh, like Scientology that they give a pass to. They just say, yeah, no, I can, it makes sense to me. I can understand why that had to happen or why it did happen. And, and it's all good. But even with somebody who's done those kinds of things, and we all do when we're in a, a cult, is we, mm -hmm. is we just ignore red flags, let stuff slip. Let stuff pass. But something happens that's personal enough, direct enough, um, and is big enough that it assaults our very sense of right, wrong in a way that we cannot deny. A, a child gets, you know, assaulted or mm -hmm. uh, your wife, you know, you're told your wife is going to get shunned and you're going to have to divorce her because we're kicking her out of the church because she had impure thoughts. Right. And so you got a decision to make and we're going to make it for you. And you're like, yeah, no, I didn't really want to make that decision for me, right? I, I think I should have something to say about that. That kind of situation presents itself and it causes a, a sudden awakening of critical thinking, of skepticism, of, wait a second, I didn't think my group was going to do this, you know? Um, uh, it, 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 this is said in a million. There's so many different ways this gets expressed or, or said. Um, you know, I knew you were a cold hearted bastard. I just didn't know you were going to be a cold hearted bastard to me. You know, this kind mm -hmm. of it becomes personal somehow, some way, whether it's done to the person themselves or their loved ones or somehow they see or experience it. And they go, wait a second, something's not right there. Now, maybe that's not enough to tip them over the edge. It's often not. It's usually a series of incidents that have to happen, depending on how deep the person is in their emotional investment and their belief. Because uh, emotional investment can be very, very strong. And the more you, you, know, you get sunk into these things, the more you're invested, the more your entire life revolves around this. Remember at the very beginning, I said this is a totalist group. 
It wants to take over every part of your life, your friends, your family, what you even even what you're wearing, what you, what music you're watching or listening to, etc. I mean, all of this stuff ends up eventually being controlled by the group. So when you've had enough or you've suddenly realized this has become too much or something happens that triggers that, that's where that tends to be the first nail. That tends to be the first thing that happens that you go, oh, uh, wait a minute, something might not be right here. And then maybe there's another one and maybe there's another one. And you're more open after that first one to seeing them. Before you were totally blind. No, 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 no. Nothing's wrong. I don't see anything wrong. I don't hear anything wrong. It's all perfect. And then something happens you can't deny. And uh, and it starts to become game over. But even that process, like for me, that first one hit me 10 years before I left. <laughs> so it took a while. But I was second gen. I was <laughs> raised in this stuff. I didn't have a different worldview outside of Scientology. So I was as all in as you can go. Other people, you know, have different experiences uh, and different levels of commitment as a result. So for some people, they might see something like that that I described. You know, hey, you're going to have to disconnect from your wife. Oh, really? No, I think I'm going to disconnect from you. And off they go. Right. And they just leave. So it can happen quickly or it can happen slowly. It all depends on those levels of emotional investment and on social networks. It depends a lot on that because social pressures alone will also keep people in these groups. There are so many things that come to mind and that we have to discuss. Tell us briefly while we have you here, yeah. your YouTube channel, what's it about? And, uh, and, and in what ways can people help you out in what you're doing? Great. Yeah. It's all about everything we've been talking about this hour. It's all detailed on my channel in, you know, I've done interviews with psychologists, sociologists, neuroscientists, even, I mean, I've ever gone there. I you know this is the kind of stuff that is just intrigues me. And, and I'm all about trying to figure out why people act the way they do and why they think the way they do. And that's what my, you know, my own cult recovery and the process of of coming out of a cult mindset and reacclimating to the big wide world. That's my channel. And in the process of doing that, I've basically just been trying to educate the whole world on the, all the stuff I've been learning and not from the point of view of I'm projecting my problems onto everybody else. I know everybody has different experiences mm. and different problems, but I think no matter what the experience or problem, when it comes to coercive control situations, domestic violence, you know, trafficking stuff, culty stuff. My channel addresses all of that. And I, and like you, I've done interviews with former Mormons, former JWs, former Christians, as well as former Scientologists, and even, even dived into the multi-level marketing and large group awareness training stuff like Amway and Herbalife and, you know, those kind of crazy things, because they're just as culty as Scientology. I have actually participated back in the day with one of those pyramid uh, scam type. Yep. They want you to change all your habits of buying. Everything goes into this one-stop shop of everything of living the whole nine. Um, may- maybe me and you need to talk at some point. Uh, can you tease our audience with uh, any 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 updates about what's been happening? Maybe with the case that just took place um, with the. Um, with the uh, famous actor, um, Danny Master. Danny Master, yeah, and then yeah, uh, yeah some give us some teasers here. I know that. Uh, you know- yeah, I know this isn't going to be. Um, I don't know when this is dropping, but you know when we're re- when as I'm sitting here right now, we just we just dropped word that I've got an interview coming tomorrow with the chief uh, with the jury foreman of the Danny Masterson trial. And that resulted in a mistrial. There's a lot of controversy, especially in the ex-Scientology world. Tons of questions about what's up with that, all answered by the jury, right? And and some of the answers that he gives and some of the data he gives is going to be a little surprising to people because there's been an awful lot of attention on Scientology in that case. You know, the jury might have had some other ideas about what they thought was important in that case. And that's what we go over with him. And then you also have, you know, on my channel, you have regular content coming out on 
Um, you know, just last week or two weeks ago, we dropped the occult foundation of Scientology all in one place. You know, you listen, you, know, you give us a, a listen for two hours and you will understand Scientology at a level that not even any Scientologist understands it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, we got good stuff. You know, there's a lot of good stuff on my channel. I do a live call in show right here every Friday night. I do a Q&A show every week where I answer people's questions, sometimes live, sometimes pre-recorded, as well as my podcast. So I, you know, I, it, there's just so much there for people to take advantage of. And I, and it's all there for free. And I really hope they do. Thank you so much, Chris. We have way too much that we have to talk about in the future. And we will. I really appreciate your time and energy and you, this we just barely touched. I think we're, we haven't even touched. We just saw the tip of the iceberg, um, not even the whole thing out of the water. We just saw barely. So there is so much. Go subscribe to him right now. Go check out his live streams. Go check out his Q and A's. Get behind what he's doing. Uh, I totally stand behind what he is standing for, and you will see him in the future here on Myth Vision as long as one of us doesn't die. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. You bet. Thanks, Derek. Bye.